Hey guys, thanks for joining me for this 46th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests for this episode include Kel Mitchell, got a new season of Deliciousness which premieres tonight on MTV. We'll also visit with actor Bradley Constant. He has the lead role on Young Rock, which airs Tuesdays on NBC. We'll also visit with Grammy-winning songwriter and producer James Fontelroy. We'll talk about the new project, 1500 Sound Academy. We'll also visit with Iron Maiden's Adrian Smith. He's got a new collaborative album called Smith Kotzen. And we'll visit with lead singer Tom England of the Swedish rock band Evergrey. Got a new album to talk about, Escape of the Phoenix. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, drop a like, comment, leave some feedback, and of course, share with your friends. Now, it's amazing that we're all so addicted to our screens that this genuinely sounds like a challenge. A website called Reviews.org is going to pay someone $2,400 to go 24 hours without any screens or technology. They'll also give you $200 to buy stuff in advance to keep you occupied for the day like board games and art supplies. Now, if you're interested and you think that you can survive, they're taking applications through Friday. They'll announce the winner on next Monday. Now, to find out if you've won, they say, quote, we'll be announcing it on our YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe. And no, I don't think they even recognize the irony. Yes, the uh, second season. It's hard to believe it's already season number two. Deliciousness set to air today on MTV. And we've got our good friend Kel Mitchell back on the line. And Kel, happy Monday to you, my friend. <laughs> hey, hey, happy Monday. Happy Monday. Yes, indeed. Deliciousness premieres tonight. So it's a celebration. <laughs> That's right. Now, do, do, uh, whenever you have a, a premiere like tonight, do you sleep the night before, Kel? Or are you just uh, on, on pins and needles, just uh, adrenaline rush? <laughs> a little bit of both, a little bit of both. I have uh, I have toddlers and, and little babies here, so uh, I'm already up anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> ready for the day. <laughs> and Kel, you know kind of what you're coming into for the second season, and what kind of uh, new stuff can the viewers expect for the new episodes coming up tonight? Oh, man, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, we're back for seconds, so, of course, we're going to have some of the same stuff that you loved on first season, but we have uh, added, like, uh, a cool game. So we have one where uh, we play this game where we start and stop the video, and we have to guess what happens next. So I don't know if you've seen those videos of cakes that look yep. like iPhones or other objects. Yeah, so we're doing stuff like that where uh, you'll see the knife come in, and it's like right on top of an iPhone. And you go, oh, is it a cake or is it an iPhone? <laughs> is it a foot or is it a cake? You know what I mean? So uh, that's definitely some, uh, a cool, fun aspect that we added to the show as well. And then, of course, all the same crazy food blunders that you're used to from uh, season one. <laughs> and being a food lover, Kel, like you are, what did you do to avoid the COVID-15? Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, eating and getting good recipes. Me and my wife love the Tasty app, uh, so we definitely uh, have the Tasty app and uh, got fun recipes to to make it home uh, together. I think everybody during this time, during the quarantine, has turned into like a bit of a chef. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, uh, because they're like cooking things. They couldn't really like go to the restaurants at first. So uh, just been cooking stuff at home. So it's been awesome. <laughs> and, and that also is job security for you whenever other people are trying to learn the cooking. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and, and as you're and sitting at home trying to figure it all out and follow the recipes, and of course you're going to mess some things up, but that's what uh, deliciousness does. It, it sheds a light on that. <laughs> now, Gail, as, as things are starting to open up a bit, I mean, how has 2021 changed for the better for you over what we were all going through last year? Yeah, man. You know, what we try to do uh, is always find uh, the good in everything, the joy in it. So keeping a smile on everybody's faces while this is going on, uh, just by sharing a smile or, uh, you know, catching up with someone to make sure they're okay. You know, uh, we were definitely doing that during this time. And then also, too, a lot of projects uh, that I wanted to work on uh, or to do, but I was a little too busy to do. <laughs> uh I started to do that. I, I actually got a book coming out as well, so I have to come back and see if that comes out uh, later this year. Uh, but yeah, yeah, definitely just, you know, spending time with family and spreading that joy, you know, uh, everywhere because we all need that joy right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and Kel, after the first season was out there and about, what was it like to get the feedback? Because uh, you never know going into a new series uh, and a new show what the feedback's going to be like, and, and, and how refreshing is that for you? Oh, so true. Oh, man. So uh, when we got, we got the call pretty quick after uh, the first season, uh, it did so well, and the ratings were through the roof, and that's always a blessing, and we were super excited to see uh, everyone loving the show. <laughs> and so uh, we're like, okay, cool, they like it, they love it, that's good. <laughs> so uh, so uh, then when that happened, we got the call for the second season, it was like, oh, yeah, let's keep this thing going. I mean, Ridiculousness is on, like, I feel like year 10 <laughs> we're doing that. So, so I'm like, yeah, but let's do that. Let's, let's do that. Let's do what they're doing. <laughs> And, Kel, I know you've got so many other things, like you said, the book, and you're also trying to, to be an influence and uh, a motivation for youngsters as well. And uh, how has that been going here in the, the part of the new year? Oh, it's been, it's been awesome. Uh, that's been something I've been doing for years, uh, like I spoke about earlier, uh, bringing that joy. You know, uh, I've been through uh, a lot of my life and learned a lot, and uh, I wanted to share and be like a big brother, be a mentor uh, to the youth and uh, help them out by giving them great advice uh, on how to navigate with the Delta and things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, man, I'm all about it. <laughs> That's right. And again, the season two premiere comes up tonight, seven Eastern, six local time on MTV right. Deliciousness. And Kel, always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can keep up with everything you got going social media wise as well, my friend. Yeah. Okay. So definitely MTV check out deliciousness and then also you can catch me uh at i am kel mitchell on instagram uh real kel mitchell on tiktok and then you go to my website and just see all the all the things that i'm into on kel mitchell.com kel mitchell.com <laughs> now, now kel you've got a little youth on me but uh how much of a challenge was tiktok for you when you got started <laughs> I will tell you this. I was like an expert at Instagram, and then they're like, okay, now you got to do TikTok. And so it was a little bit of a learning curve, but now I feel like I got it. Like uh, the other day, Tiffany uh, actually told me, she was like, whoa, how did you do this? That one TikTok challenge. How did you do that? You got to show me how to do it. So, uh, yeah, I, it was a little bit of a learning curve, but I got it now. I got it. I'm a, a TikToker now. <laughs> there you go. Well, well, I'll check you out. Me, You'll have a new follower here real quick. Uh, Kel, always great to visit with you, brother. Look forward to talking to you about the book and uh, hope you have a great rest of your week, brother. Thank you. You too. Have a great week. Well, mount thy steeds, brave culture warriors, for thine week's battle hath arrived. Well, if you can remember the outages ago when uh, House Probe decided to change Mr. Potato Head brand name to just Potato Head, well, here's their next benign change that should still get social media arguing. Hasbro announced that Monopoly is getting a, quote, refresh. They'll be changing all 16 community chess cards for the first time in 85 years to try to bring them more in line with modern life. Quote, covering topics like beauty contests, holiday funds, and life insurance, there's no denying the Monopoly game's community chess cards are long overdue for a refresh. Now you can vote on the new cards on their website. Some possibilities are you help build a new school playground, then you get to test the slide, collect $100. And blasting music late at night, your neighbors don't approve, go directly to jail. The new cards should be an official part of the game by the end of the year. Excited to talk again about Young Rock on NBC, and uh, we've got none other than Young Rock, Bradley Constant on the line. And first off, Bradley, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Of course. Thanks for having me, man. Bradley, tell us first off what it was like whenever you finally found out that you got the role. I mean, how much uh, crazy fanboy was uh, coming out in you? <laughs> a lot of crazy fanboy, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I've been a big fan and uh, for really all my life. And, you know, auditioning for it, you know, you try to keep your head level so you never get like, oh, yeah, this is real. And it never really hit until I booked it. I was like, wait, whoa, wait, this is really happening. <laughs> uh, There's just lots of different ways. You know, things really didn't even settle in until, you know, our premiere a few weeks ago. Um, you know, I remember getting that call. I got a call from my rep. He's like, "Yeah, am I speaking to uh, the guy that's playing Dwayne Johnson on a TV show?" I was like, "Why?" My mom started 
screaming in the background and we can't hear anything. Yeah, it's just it's really special and you know, this is it's a big moment for me, but it's just even more special to be a part of something, you know, a group like this. I mean, our huge cast and everyone is just so sweet. I mean, I know everybody says this and we wanna brag about, you know, our coworkers, but I really think we have the most special group of people from our crew to our cast and production and everyone there. It's just so cool. Being young, younger than uh, than many in the acting field, how were you able to maybe adjust? As obviously the uh, recording and uh, on set time was way different than uh, things you'd seen before, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it was it was a big learning experience for me, um, especially being surrounded by so many talented actors. You know, I really made sure to soak up as much as I could. You know. And, um, stand around even when I didn't have to be and hang around set a little longer than they probably would have liked me to. <laughs> you <know? laughs> uh, but you know what? You know, it, it was a huge learning experience for me and, you know, I gained a lot of confidence and a lot of knowledge from it. And, you know, I'll be able to take that with me going forward. So it's been really cool. What was maybe the biggest surprise as as you got working on the series? Was there maybe something about Dwayne that, uh, that you learned you were a little surprised about? Well, you know what? Nothing, nothing really hit me where I was like, "What?" You know, what did I understand? Uh, but I think it, it was pretty cool to see how involved, um, you know, his family was with all the other wrestlers in his childhood. You know, and they're really family friends to him, um, which I thought was pretty cool. I had no idea about that. Now, for you, what's been the biggest challenge thus far taking on a role of a of a person larger than life that uh, that everybody I think <laughs> has a little bit of an idea how the the role needs to be portrayed, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me and for you know you know other Dwayne's, I think it was uh, really not mimicking him. You know, we we know who he is, but um, it was really important to kind of look at okay, well, this is a time where he's becoming who he is now, so. You know, he's, this is when he's a lot more like the rest of us. You know? <laughs> and uh, so it was really not thinking about, oh, yeah, I'm playing Dwayne Johnson. But it was kind of just looking at the script and being like, OK, this is a 15 year old, maybe myself at 15 and putting yourself in that situation, putting yourself in those shoes and how you would feel. You know, this is me playing him at 15, especially this was a really tough time. Um, you know, his family was struggling financially and. You know, there's just a lot of tough dynamics going on. He moved around a good bit. And, um, you know, latching on to those things for me that I could relate with my own life just made it easy. And, of course, uh, more episodes of uh, Season 1, Young Rock, airing Tuesdays, 8 Eastern, 7 local time on NBC. Now, Bradley, for you, are you one that uh, keeps up with the, the reviews and the ratings and all that? I know you guys got a good one back from Rotten Tomatoes, which is big, but it, do you shy away from those, or do you do you read every one? <laughs> well, you know what? I tell myself that I, I don't want to read them, but, you know, you can't help it. <laughs> Sometimes I, I do find myself scrolling through the phone at night before I go to bed and reading a couple of them. But it's just <laughs> been so nice to see all, you know, the positive feedback on everything. Because, you know, you don't, you know, I don't really do this career for myself. I really hope that, you know, people are enjoying what we're putting out. You know, for me, um, anytime I got home from work after a long day, it was really fun to go home and watch a show. And if it made me smile or made me feel something, that was important. And I hope that, you know, people are able to get that from our show. And it seems like people are, you know, there's a lot of good messages and it can put a smile on their face at the end of the day. So now what was the first wrestling move that you've had to learn or, or are you, uh, are you maybe, uh, getting the rust knocked off a little bit, trying to learn uh, some moves? <laughs> Well, I didn't. I didn't have to learn any for for this season, but um, I'm sure game for it if we get to go back around too. I love to wrestle some fools. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, even me when I was little, me and my buddies, we used to wrestle in the front yard or at the house, and you know, we'd try to mimic some moves, which <laughs> probably a little bit dangerous, more dangerous, besides <laughs> and. We probably should have left it to the professionals, but <laughs> that's good stuff. Now, Bradley, if folks want to find out not only more information about the show, but everything you've got going social media wise, what's the best place to keep up with you? Um, you can find everything about me on Instagram at Bradley Constant. All right. Well, Bradley, I, I guess we'll let you go. Hopefully, uh, look forward to seeing your rendition of the People's Elbow real soon. 
<laughs> we'll see, man. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Bradley, have a great rest of the week. Thank you so much for your time, brother. Of course. You too. Well, good news. We've got a new trick that you can use to really help improve your memory. The bad news is you're going to have to use paper and pen like a caveman. Well, a new study at the University of Tokyo figured out that people remember stuff way better if they handwrite it with a pen and paper. When we do that, we commit it to memory way better than if we type it. Now, the researchers think it's because using a paper and pen is more tactile, and so we form a stronger memory because it's using more parts of our brain. And with that in mind, we have this for you to check out. Everybody's talking about the new tablet, made of yellow 8x11 paper, and it has a stack of memory. And it comes with this black stylus, so you can write right on the tablet. Make a mistake? No problem. Just use the delete function and cross the mistake off. One of the best parts? The theft protection. We tested leaving the tablet on a table outside a coffee shop. No one ever steals it. It's there when you return. It's the all-new yellow legal pad and black pen. Also available in white and blue. Grammy award-winning songwriter, producer, and so much other than that as well. James Fontleroy on the line with us. And first off, James, I appreciate you taking the time, brother. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. Now, now, James, we said uh, a lot extra other than just songwriter and producer. And I know the 1500 Sound Academy, how did you get involved in that? And uh, I would just want to share the mission uh, of the Academy as well. Well, the way I got involved, uh, my partner, Lawrence Dobson, and I uh, have been in the music business for about 15 years professionally. And even though we love music with all of our little music hearts, the business we found was less exciting than a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> and so um, over time and, and trying to figure out different ways to, to help and what to do and, and what, you know, to, to carve out a path along the way, we, we were blessed to find our partner, Twyla True, to... Um, to start this school and, and start giving people more tools and um, hopefully a better chance at success facing their dreams. Now, James has the internet, social media, and all that. A lot of folks seem to think that, man, that makes it easy to be the, the real quick hit. But does is that making your job easier, I guess? The internet? Yeah, the, the everybody having socials and being able to post out their videos and all that stuff. Yes and no. Yes, it, it, it's it was in the, it's inevitable. Um, I'm a huge nerd, like, um, so I'm I'm really into technology and the internet, and I, I have been since I discovered it. Um, creatively, it it everyone having access to everything everyone's doing makes it hard for us to have a, a um, you know a, a sound in in an area like there used to be the Detroit sound and there was East Coast and there was West Coast because people will be working in private and then release the music, whereas now everyone can see what everyone's doing literally live. And so, you know, it's easier for people to look at what someone else is doing, which is fine, you know, it's, there's, because there's innovation that will come out of that too. So there's, there's pros and cons to the Internet thing. But I think in terms of opportunities, it couldn't be better than it is now. Now, as a songwriter, for you this last 12 months, has the has the writing been darker that, that you've noticed, maybe the inspiration, if you will? Well, I um, I think maybe, I, I don't know, I was like designed for hermit life. <laughs> Personally, I have like a little bun on top of my head and I put on a kimono and walk around the house. Um, but, no, I, I think... Um, the stuff I've been hearing has been uh, has been hopeful. I think that's part of our job is to create a comfortable escape for as many people as we can reach. You know, that's the the value of our of our you know, and, and the the privilege of us as artists and creatives is that we get to build uh, you know, audio or visual or whatever experiential um escape for people. 
And for you to be able to give back and give others an opportunity, uh, you know how hard the road is. And to be able to help folks taking the right steps along the pathway, how does that make you feel on a personal level, not so much on the professional side? Well, on the personal level, I think that that's, there's nothing better in this world that you can do than give. You know, like giving um, in every way, whether even though people don't necessarily seem to realize but the, the happiest thing you can do, even even coded in all of our our stories and things we tell each other and, and how we live, there's a little secret line of code that tells us all that giving is the ultimate um, act in terms of how you feel, what it does. It just it's it's maybe the only thing that everyone involved uh, gets something out of it. So for me, it's 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 been a personal goal to make as many things um, as I can be about giving. Not only because it makes me feel good and all these, and I got my little um, hermit bun and I'm just floating and all this, but also because literally your value in the business is how much of service you are to the people around you. Right. Service um, as far as the, the art you're making, how does that affect the consumer? And then service, uh, you know, behind the scenes with all the people that, that get the art out. So the more um, of use and, and of, of service you and your art are, you'll be happy. And that's really nice and great, but you'll also pay more money. Those are the two things. Now, James, how excited are you as, what do you think, how do you think the sound of is going to change over the next few years, over the music that's been done uh, in secret, if you will, over the last 12 months? Um, I think it's going to be amazing. I, I think we're going to, we're going to um, keep doing what we've been doing. I tell people all the time, because everyone, and, and even me sometimes, I'll forget this thing I'm about to say, but I tell everyone all the time. Because people always say, oh, the music when I was young was so great, or the music of the past is always so great. And since recorded music began, people have been recording terrible music <laughs> every decade. <laughs> every decade that ever was, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of really terrible, bad songs. And what happened was, we just stopped playing those songs. We only play the ones that we like. And that's why it seems like the music of the past is so much better. So I think that what we're going through is we're just in the moment of people trying new things. Things are going to fail. Things are going to are going to fly. And I think there's just going to, uh, you know, I think humanity still has a lot of incredible um, places to explore in music. That's right. And again, the 1500 Sound Academy, James, I want to make sure and let folks know if uh, they want more information about that. Where's the, where's the best place? You can go to our Instagram, 1500 Sound Academy, or our website, 1500sound.academy, and sign up today. Well, James, it has been great to visit with you, my friend. Uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Same to you. This is great. Well, it looks like it's Jim Carrey's turn to start sequelizing his old hits. Ace Ventura 3 is in the works, and it'll reteam Jim with the writers of the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. A statement from the producers at Morgan Creek says, quote, It's noticeable from the three million fans chatting on the official Facebook page for Ace Ventura that audiences are clamoring for a third installment. During COVID, audiences have been in love and are thrilled to have beloved characters brought back with new stories. The original Ace Ventura Pet Detective came out in 1994, Ace Ventura When Nature Calls followed in 1995, and there was a reboot with Jim Carrey in 2009 called Ace Ventura Jr. Pet Detective. Well, our next guest, the legendary rocker Adrian Smith from Iron Maiden, got a new collaborative project called Smith Cotson. First off, Adrian, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. No problem, no problem. Now, a bit early for me, but you know. <laughs> now, now, Adrian, tell us a little bit about uh, about the new album, uh, working with Richie on this, and uh, how excited you are to have some new work out there, especially in the midst of uh, all we've been going through. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great. We're both, we're both really excited about the album um, coming out on Friday. Um, you know, I've I've known Richie for seven eight years. 
I moved to the West Coast. Um, well, I lived part time on the West Coast of America, and uh, you know, there's a lot of musicians out here. We got to know each other, got jamming, discovered we we like the same kind of music. Someone said, "Hey, well, you know, why don't you write?" Um, and we wrote, and we you know, we just started smashing out all these songs really, really quickly, and uh, the chemistry was there, you know. So we thought we'd take advantage of it, you know, and uh, we started working on the album 2019, early part of 2019. Uh, then we had a break because we had our respective, you know, bands touring, and then we came back 2020 and finished it off. So yeah, we're really excited about it. Now, what was what's it look like finishing a product project in in 2020 and uh, 2021 as opposed to all the projects you've done before, Adrian? Well, you know, we started this before the pandemic and and the lockdown and everything, and um, so you know, it's not there's not a lockdown album, so. <laughs> We didn't get bored and decided right now. We, this was sort of born out of a passion for the for the music. You know, I grew up listening to sort of early seventies music when I was a kid. That inspired me to be a musician. Free, Bad Company, Humble Pie. So that was our sort of jumping off point. You know, um, yeah, and you know, certainly between uh, those days and now, you know, the, the record industry is very different. But you do what you do. You know, you still want to make music. And get it out there, and I, I, I think uh, you know a lot of people like this kind of music. It's, it's uh, still a, a thriving genre of music. It's classic. It, you know, it's, it stood the test of time. And I, I feel sort of um, I've wanted to make an album like this for for a long while, sort of pay tribute to the stuff that inspired me, and um, contribute to this uh, this this genre really. So uh, that's my take on it really. Well, Adrian, I've noticed uh, a lot of classic artists have come out with with some new music. And I think the thing that probably impresses me the most is, you know, whenever we heard you guys back in the day, uh, we all wondered what kind of voice are those guys going to have left (laughs) after traveling and touring for many years? And Adrian, what's what's the trick? I'm I'm shocked everybody still has voices left. Yeah, well, maybe you uh were. Uh, your voice gets a little more, shall we say, seasoned <laughs> over the years. Which for, for uh, Smith concert music is 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 perfect. You know, you want that because it's all about the you know uh, a lot of the songs are about uh, you know life. You know, we have a song called Scars, for yourself explanatory. You know, things that happen to you in your life that have a massive effect on you. You know, you can call them scars really and have a bearing on your future. Um, you know, a song called Running. I mean, it's it's um, about, you know, somebody, maybe a young person running from themselves, can't look in the mirror, you know. It's about life, really. So have a little bit of seasoning on your voice doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Adrian, what was the what was the biggest thing that you were able to maybe in your introspection come up with in this uh, in this past year? Was there anything that you in particularly really focused on? Well, music's been, you know, incredibly important in this to me in this in this period. You know, um, I've got a studio at my house, and so I spent a lot of time in there just writing, working on my singing and playing. You know, um, as well as spending time with a family. I mean, I haven't had a summer off um, for about twenty years because we're, you know, usually touring. You know, so it was nice to have a bit of time at home. Obviously, you know, it's affected people um, quite badly. It affects all of us. You know to an extent but um yeah you just got to hunker down and and uh, it's amazing how adaptable we are you know as human beings we you know it's an absolutely you know terrible thing that's happened but you know people are just getting on with their lives what else can you do and it's light at the end of the tunnel you know so <laughs> that's right got the vaccines now so hopefully we'll get back to normal soon now, Adrian, what was the biggest thing you had to learn technologically this last year? We've all had to learn new things, uh, Zoom and all those things. What uh, what technologic thing did you have to learn? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, all the Zoom stuff, and uh, you know, uh, as far as recording goes, you know, Richie. I mean, Richie's really good uh, with the technology. I, I'm, I'm, I had to learn a lot because we did a lot of the engineering and, and uh, production on the album ourselves. So. Um, it's it's always a little distracting the technology because you you know as a musician you just want to you just want to get it done and get it down while the inspiration's there. So, but the more technology you learn, the easier that is to do. You know that's the way it is these days. You know. 
That's right. And uh, Adrian, if folks want to find out more information about uh, about the new album, the music videos, the singles and all that, where's the best place to keep up with it? Well, there's a website, uh, Smith Cotson, um, dot com, and then you can get all your information about it. Uh, buy the album and you got bundles there as well what they call bundles uh, get signed stuff and you know t-shirts and all that and that uh, kind of thing I've got an Instagram Mr. Adrian Smith and it just keeps you up to date with what I'm doing uh, I think Richie's got one as well I can't remember the address but um, and, and you know we've got YouTube the good old YouTube um, <laughs> it's when you can see the, we've got three videos out which are cracking videos are really pleased with the way they turned out uh, yeah, it's all out there. It's all out there. All right. Well, Adrian, again, thank you so much for your time this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your week, continued success, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again real soon. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Cheers. Now, would your mom be proud of anything that you did today? Well, if not, you might want to raise your social etiquette game. Well, here are six rules that we think everyone should follow. Number one, say please and thank you. Please do not forget to do this and thank you. Number two, step outside to answer phone calls. You are actually louder than you think and no one wants to hear you talk to your insurance agent anyway. Number three, when driving, use your turn signals. Now I get that you know where you're gonna merge left, but I don't and letting the other person know that's the whole point. So give people a heads up, not using them is dangerous and well, it's also rude. Number four, cough or sneeze into your elbow. Now that should be a no brainer after COVID, but it doesn't make it any less courteous to others. Number five, write thank you notes. The best ones are handwritten, but even a text message is nice when you wanna say thanks for something small. Now, taking a few minutes to do it will make them happy, and it tends to make you happy, too. And number six, let people get off the elevator before you get on, and the same goes for public transit. So there you go, just six social etiquette rules that we could all follow, and, well, it'd make life a little bit easier on all of us. We're going to visit, get to know a little bit about the the rock band from Sweden, Evergrey, with uh, Tom England today. And first off, Tom, I appreciate you taking some time to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Now, uh, first off, I don't know what I, I, I hit an accident uh, button, turned my video off there. Sorry about that, Tom. But uh, uh, the new album came out in, in February, had a month under your belt with it. And what's it like to have some new music out, especially after what the last 12 months have been like? Well, uh, I mean, the, the music isn't new for us anymore. It's like we, we this album's been finished since October for us. So, you know, uh, but that comes with the territory sort of. So, yeah, I mean, it's just lovely to be able to to share the what we've been working on for like a, not a full year, but at least like seven, eight months and uh, and uh, and finally get it out there. Uh, and I mean, yeah, it's a special year to, to record music. It's a special year to release music and... and uh, Ah, it's a special year for all of us. So for us, nothing really changed. If anything, it was for the better because we didn't have to fly off and do shows in between <laughs> the recording process. So, uh, but other outside of that, you know, we just did the same old thing, tried to make the best song possible. And, and uh, here we are. And there you go. Now, got together back around uh, 95, 96 time frame. Tom, how did, how did Evergrey first form and and who were your early influences i mean i was working at a music shop where where uh, andy la rock from king diamond were mending guitars in between his tours so i got to know him a bit and he had a studio and so and i just you know had formed every with people that i met in the store uh, i sold guitars uh, so um yeah that's how it started and then we recorded a demo with him very early in, in 94 actually oh so. wow wow so it's even we're even older, <laughs> older than Santa Claus soon. Yeah, but uh, yeah. So I mean, one thing led to another. We quickly received a, a record deal and and um, started recording our first album. And uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, who were your Sorry. musical influences? The the folks that influenced you and inspired you early on. I mean. Andy was one of them. Uh, King Diamond was a huge uh, influence on me because he. 
I knew that it held, you know, Swedish guys in the band. You know, we had also Mickey D then who later, you know, went into Motorhead. And, mm-hmm. and so it made it sort of realistic for me to to see that I could also become a rock person in a sense, you know, uh, traveling the world and all that. So that that was my end game and that was the goal. And he made it and they made it uh, possible in a sense. We also had the Swedish rock band Europe at the time that had massive, you know, hits on, on all the charts oh, yeah. all over the world, selling millions of albums. So, yeah. But, I mean, I, I came from a background of death metal. I came uh, also listening a lot to Maiden and Ingrid Malmsteen and, uh, uh, yeah, all of the stuff that was great at that time and still is today almost. So, yeah. Now, you've seen rock popularity kind of go up and down in the States. What's what's it been like in, in Europe? Has the throng still the same? The numbers still look the same for rock music or, or has it also seen the fluctuations as well? I mean, for us, that's the sort of... <laughs> advantage being a smaller band we, yeah. we are still we are still rising so for us it's always it's only gone up honestly so uh being on our 12th album now saying that that's quite uh, remarkable to be honest but uh, <laughs> but uh I, so I, I i mean of course there was a time when i think when uh when the grunge period hit i think that sort of erased a lot of the the a lot of the bands that came out at least in europe at that time and then all of a sudden, everybody had to wear flannel shirts and sing about, <laughs> I don't know what they sang about. So, you know, Anger. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, that I mean, at least that changed the climate. I, I mean, I, I loved a lot of those bands, but 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 it really made a change uh, towards the whole music scene in the world, I guess. So, But, it, I mean, rock will never go away. That's the right. thing. That's the cool thing about being in a metal band, too. We... We are have we have the best fans in the world. We they, they they buy stuff. They come to the concerts, and we you know we don't need we don't need number one radio hits to to survive. You know? <laughs> That's right. Now, has the last year the the songwriting for you has has the emphasis changed maybe or the inspiration for for the music? Well, I did actually. I did a quite. I did an analysis since the album has been getting so many rave reviews, and you know we're on charts everywhere, and and it's that was quite remarkable for me in a sense because I we're not used to that success in a sense. <laughs> so I made a quick analysis of why that might have been, and then I came to the I came to the conclusion that I've been uh, throughout the years writing about you know, feeling like an outsider and uh, the themes of solitude and loneliness, but also from a perspective of more sorrow and, and, and sadness, maybe. Mm. And for this album, I've come from a perspective of writing about the same things, but uh, writing about them from a perspective of strength and from a place of self-esteem and, and uh, you know, pride of who I've become at the same time, you know. Uh, going from feeling like an outsider to still feeling like an outsider to the world, the main part of the world, but at least finding my place within it, you know. So, I guess. Wh- yeah. Where did where did that realization come for you? Getting fatter in age, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that aging a little bit. I understand that. Yeah, yeah but I mean, honestly, I mean, it's uh, uh, for for the most for the most of us, we we get wiser, we get. Uh, <laughs> somewhat smarter throughout our years in, 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 in this, on this planet. And that helps in every aspect of, of life, I guess. Now, Tom talked about, uh, started recording back 94. That's 27 years. How mm. do you keep the voice? I mean, the, I was listening actually uh, w- right before we connected, listening to the pipes. How do you keep those in tune is, and has this last year been good for that? I mean, for me, I'm, uh, I'm blessed enough to, to, to not have an issue with them ever. Uh, in my younger days, I, I drank a lot and smoked a lot and did everything that was bad for the voice. And, and right. I think I, I think I canceled one show in my whole life due to the fact that I lost my voice. And that was basically because I talked too much. So for <laughs> tours, I, 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 I tend to not do as many interviews during the days because that really ruins the voice, uh, talking and talking and talking. But, uh, other than that, I don't do anything. I, I sing a lot. I guess you know it's like riding a bicycle. If <laughs> if you do it a lot, you get better at it. You know, <laughs> kicking a football around or whatever. You know, it's uh, it's practice and practice. And I guess I'm not practicing per se, but 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 singing a lot is is uh, maintaining the the voice. I guess. Now, vocally, where did you get the inspiration? Where did where did you who did you maybe try to draw that inspiration vocally from? 
Well, the thing is, I wasn't planning on becoming a vocalist at all. Uh, six weeks before the first uh, album recording we 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 did, uh, our singer uh, left the band. So so I was more like, why don't you sing? And I was like, oh. So that first album recording process was a bit uh, of a horror experience for me singing one faint uh, singing one sentence and then fainting you know <laughs> pretty much because i i couldn't uh, i didn't have the technique down at all at that time and also at that time recording onto tape which we did it back in the day you know that uh, costed a hell of a lot of money you know? <laughs> yes, so it did. so uh, yeah it was a it was a challenge but i mean and it was a very long time before i actually referred to myself as a singer so I was say, yeah, I play guitar in a band. Oh, yeah, and I sing too, you know. <laughs> I so sing a little uh, bit too. <laughs> uh, so I did never had any real vocal idols. I mean, I listened to Bruce Dickinson's and uh, David Gilmour's of Pink Floyd and whatever, you know, uh, all of those guys. But uh, but never had a. I mean, of course, I, there's so many vocalists that I love, you know, but uh, but never anyone that really influenced. And hence, maybe that's why I sound like the way I do, uh, a mixture of. No one and everyone, I guess. <laughs> all and all and none, all at once. Yeah, exactly. Now, as we went through the last year, and now you've got the the new album been out for about a month. How d- have you guys had to alter the goal setting uh, for for twenty twenty one as opposed to what you you may have had in times past? Uh, yeah, I mean, usually we're at this time we're out on tour, of course, uh, and uh, I mean that that's the thing that we have had to to postpone three times so far. Uh, and the other thing is also coming to America is also going to be a bit difficult, I think, until you have your stuff under control and we have our <laughs> stuff under control. And it's, I mean, it's it's difficult as it is to come to America in terms of uh, green cards and paperwork and whatever visas. So that. It's actually somewhat uh, worrying for me, not knowing when that will happen again. I also I'm also in an American band called Redemption, uh, uh, and uh, not knowing when I can come over and do that album is also one of the things that I, yeah, it's somewhat worrying to be honest. I don't think we will have a, a, a grip of this beast before the end of this year. To be honest, I don't want to I don't want to downplay anything or sound pessimistic, right, but I think that's right. the real reality of it. So. Now, as uh, you, you talked about the other music as well, trying to get the, uh, the the travel set up, what's what's the biggest thing that you've missed ab- about not being able to play? Is it is it the crowd? Is it the lights? Is it what is it yeah, you miss most? It's, no, it's the it's the fans, it's the audience, it's the people that give us that you know immediate reward of you know having looking somebody in the eyes while performing it's that's uh, that's why we do this it's uh, it's quite heart wrenching in a sense um, not being able to know when that's going to happen again and and uh, we also have a damn good album that we want to play for people you know so it's typical our luck in a sense you know? so, <laughs> ah they could have made it but then came the pandemic you know it's like <laughs> So where, when is, do you guys have, have you guys played at all in the last, uh, the last year? I know there's been some in the States that have played regional and local stuff. Have you guys had the opportunity to even play? No, we did, uh, we did, uh, one of these o- online shows mm-hmm. broadcasted with totally professional with like eight or 10 cameras. And, wow. uh, uh, so it was really cool in that sense, but yeah, no, no, no other shows at all. You, you think it, it could be through the end of the year uh, for you guys over there, huh? Yeah, I mean, we have a European tour booked from October to November. I, I doubt that will happen. But then we have some domestic gigs uh, in, in the end of uh, November, I think, beginning of December. And that's when I think it could possibly be realistic to, 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 to do them. Well, again, uh, Tom, I want to make sure and let folks know where to find more information. The The album is out, Escape of the Phoenix, Evergrey, and then, uh, like you said, Redemption and, and everything else you've got going social media-wise as well. Yeah, I mean, we're on all the all the social medias like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and whatever. So if you want to join us, please do. All right. Well, again, check out the new album from Evergrey. And uh, Tom, it's been great to have the chance to visit with you today. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Maybe it'll warm up over there in Sweden this week for you. I hope so. I need it. I need it. I need the sun. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for having me. Again, thanks for joining me for this 46th episode in season two of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. 
If you ever have a comment, a question, maybe anything else you'd like to know, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can buy me a coffee by clicking the tab at the bottom square of your screen. You can also visit the shop at gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. If you have a special guest idea, email me gqwithcam at gmail.com. Again, thanks to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our music. We're going to let him play us out. We'll be back with episode 47 coming up tomorrow. <laughs>